Okay, we'll do one more. Oh, oh wow. I'm talking to Jason Silva. What's up, bro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been a fan for the longest time ever. Oh, and thank you so much, man. I'm so used to your voice and your picture on my laptop screen or my phone screen. Nice. I swear to God, when I saw you in that room, it's like the Matrix glitched. You yeah, know? there was a glitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways, um, the dream is collapsing. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so I'm a psychiatrist, but I also wow. have a lot of interest in uh, space and in, uh, natural, in the natural world. Yeah. So my question to you is, uh, because I face that a lot at work when I talk about love being the pillar, you know, yeah. human connection and love being the ultimate pillar. Yeah. A, lo a lot of scientists give me the, you know, the pseudoscience talk. They don't believe in that. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though we've seen in biology when we've extracted the hormones and chemicals that mimic the experience of inner peace in the oh, brain. Of course. And we add them to cells in petri dishes. We yeah, can yeah. recognize yeah, yeah, growth, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, but I mean, we are, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, we are more than biology. We are also stories. Yeah. You know, I mean, our biology creates the stories in our heads, but the stories in our heads also shapes our biology. It's Absolutely. a feedback loop. So, Absolutely. yeah. And you can also see the sense of love to be translated in quantum physics or astrophysics as this innate affinity uh -huh. matter has to react with other matter. Sure. And I think it's quite romantic when you look at the timeline of the universe going from quarks to proteins. Yeah. It's quite romantic too. Yeah. So my question to you um, is um, if that was the original intention in religion and in the chronicles of faith, if that was the original message, love and connection, doesn't that make you the alchemist that gives vision to the visionless? And if that's the original meaning of religion and the original meaning of how humans should live their life, then today you were walking on water, sir. Huh. So, wow. thank you. Oh. <laughs> so I just want to get your take on Terence McKenna's thoughts on the transcendental object at the end of time. Transcendental um, object at the end yeah. of time. So, <laughs> yeah, be a landmine. I think... Uh, <laughs> There's a, there's a guy called, uh, well, thank you for your kind words and, you know, uh, whatever you see in me, I see in you. So it takes one to know one, bro. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, as, <laughs> as far as the transcendental object, well, first, to respond to the power of love, there's a guy called Rich Doyle. He's a professor of rhetoric. He calls it uh, The Power of Language at University of Pennsylvania. He wrote a book called Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and the Evolution of the Nuosphere, which of course is what rises above the biosphere, is the kingdom of ideas and memes that cloaks the planet in information. He says that words inform reality. And for those that think that words don't cause physical changes in physical systems, Think of how much energy is required to say the word, I love you. It's a certain amount of energy, right? But that, the, the, the amount of energy that I require to say the word, I love you, is much less than the amount of energy that it could impact the person that receives that word, right? So it could have a much more energy, impactful effect on somebody than the energy required to utter those words. So words can definitely impact physical systems. We are physical systems, and language can completely affect our neurochemistry and have a, a, a dent and leave a dent. As far as the transcendental object at the end of the day, there's, a, there's a, a theory that tries to account for Fermi's paradox. Fermi's paradox is the paradox that says the universe in all its vastness seems prime for life. Now we're finding so many exoplanets that meet the Goldilocks, Earth-like conditions for life. But why don't we see evidence of advanced civilizations when the conditions seem so prime for it? The scales seem so inevitable. So what this guy says, the transcension hypothesis says, and this makes sense when you look at what's happening with us, Advancement of all technological civilization goes both ways. It goes outer and it goes inner. Outer means, you know, we spread it throughout the land, we conquer the rest of the planet, maybe eventually we put bases on the moon, maybe we'll reach other planets, we'll, we'll expand outwards. But there's a simultaneous expansion inwards, right? Computation gets denser and denser and denser, right? Eventually, we'll get to femtoscale. It's smaller than nano. Femtoscale densities of computation. These are the densities of black holes, okay? 
When you get to femtoscale densities of computation, and by that point, we'll be living in virtual worlds because we'll leave biology behind. So imagine a universe, a matrix, right? But not a dystopian matrix like in the movie, but a, a paradise kind of matrix, a virtual reality where everybody, full flourishing of human imagination in an infinite, boundless cosmos of the mind, okay? Femtoscale densities and virtual worlds inside those femtoscale densities. Eventually, all of mind leaves space and time behind because we go into these black hole dimensions outside of space and time, slingshot to the end of time, and high five every other advanced technological civilization. <laughs> That's transcension. And it's an interesting theory put out there. The guy John Smart put it. That was the closest thing that I found in astronomy, in terms of astronomy theories, uh, to, to McKenna's transcendental object at the end of time. So maybe the new space is inner space. Maybe we have to stop worrying about conquering other lands and start exploring all the space down below and within, you know? Okay. So, Thank you so yeah. much. I think we're good. Huh? I think we're good. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, should we take one more? Sure. Or are we good? One more?